introduce to you uh, the keynote today by Laura Tony Harris. Uh, for me, this is a very important moment because uh, two years ago uh, I was uh, a PhD student uh, doing a knowledge exchange with Nano Resilience. And the first time I heard Laura Harris, it was uh, one of the first times in my life that I heard somebody that was actually in a place of power saying things as I would have wanted them to say it. At the time we were taking <laughs> That sounds very strange, but it's okay. <laughs> the key topic was power failure and how to prepare, how to understand power failure. Since then, I understood better the work of Lord Harris, understanding his report on terrorism uh, in 2016, an incident review for a major plan on London preparedness to measure terrorism. The event uh, of this winter at the Bay Airport about the, the use of drones and the possible threat for our security. Uh, Lord Harris is currently the critical coordinator of, of Electrical Infrastructure Security Council, chair of the Independence Reference Group for National Crime Agency, chair of the National Training Standard Board, uh, and has been made life here in 1998. So his experience in this sector is huge. And today, he will speak about how our society has a broader view of complex event. To him to speak, and it's my honor and my pleasure to have him here speaking today. Thank you for coming. Given the number of people in the room, I went to Rory Stewart and take my tie off as well. Certain limits, certain limits. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman, for that uh, uh, introduction. Um, I do find it slightly daunting. Uh, however, as you pointed out, I am a politician. I'm not really a politician. I'm a recovering politician, <laughs> um, and um, that uh, means that I have absolutely no compunction about talking in very broad brush terms, which we'll discover in a minute, um, and also talking about things about which there are people in the audience who are far more expert than I am. Um, so that's, uh, I'm afraid, the characteristic, and I hope that won't uh, uh, cause any problems. And I'm certainly intending to range quite widely. But I do just want to start with um, a little bit of uh, audience participation. That's all right, no beanbags are involved. Um, <laughs> who here has seen a film by Mel Brooks? I bet I'd be worried that actually the demographics were such that uh, no one would have heard of it. Now, four years before Mel Brooks' biggest hits, which were Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein, um, he produced a film called The Twelve Chairs. Has anyone seen that? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you won't remember the theme song, and as I promise I'm not going to sing it, uh, Hope for the Best, Expect the Worst, which is inspired by a title. And it's very much a motto for today's presentation as I intend to focus on very high impact scenarios and also what's going on across the world. Now, my first job after I left university was in the economics division of the Bank of England. I shared an office with one Theresa Brazier, now our outgoing prime minister. Now, if that sounds a little intimate, I should explain that the office was a vast open plan expanse covering the entire fourth floor of the Fred Needle Street Fortress of the Bank of England. Uh, and in some weird and wonderful way, known only to the Bank of England's Human Resources Department, um, uh, the, all the left, vaguely left of centre people, were clustered at one end of the floor, and all the vaguely right of centre people were clustered at the other. How they did that, I don't know. So we weren't actually to be honest, that close physically or indeed in any other way. But now my point in mentioning that is really just a warm-up to allow the latecomers to take their seats. The point is mentioning it, this was over 40 years ago. And that was the time, for those who remember that um, British economic and political history, was the time of the IMF crisis. And the story was, the story then was, that it was very simple to do economics in Britain, because every year was an average year for the British economy. By average, you meant it was worse than last year and better than next year. 
So over a three-year period, you're always average. Now, I suspect that uh, that rather pessimistic view that we're on a downturn is um, still the case today with the current Brexit fiasco. Um, the most overused Chinese curse, actually it's the only one I know, is may you live in interesting times. Now, the British Ministry of Defence, six months ago, published its Global Strategic Trends report that warned, and I quote, the world is becoming ever more complex and volatile. The only certainty about the future is its inherent uncertainty. What is more, they said, the rate of change and the level of uncertainty may outpace good governance. The complex interaction of these trends is potentially game-changing and demands a new approach that places strategic adapt adaptability at its core. And that actually is a lesson for all of us. Now, I have a great deal of sympathy with the um, uh, nuclear physicist Niels Bohr when he said, all prediction is uncertainty. It's uncertain, particularly prediction about the future. Uh, and as someone with uh, uh, an economics degree a long time ago from Cambridge University, I'm also mindful of J.K. Galbraith's view that the only function of economic forecasting is to make astrology look respectable. <laughs> <laughs> so having got the uh, caveats from two Nobel laureates on the record, I am nonetheless going to look at some of the global trends that are already in place and has some views about where those trends are going to take us. The trends I'm talking about encompass uh, climate, ch um, in climate change. I trust no one here is a climate change denier. <laughs> um, the trends encompass the very substantial changes in demography that we can expect, further globalization coupled with greater global inequality, the significant but already visible social and political trends in a context of greater and intense competition for natural resources. Taken together, these will create, these changes will create a series of pressure cook, cooker-like political tensions whose outlet may well be, for example, increased terrorist violence and will certainly pose serious security concerns. Some of you will recall the Monty Python sketch, no one expected the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> well, I suspect in 1450 BC, there were not many people who predicted the destruction of the Minoan culture as a result of a volcanic eruption. Nor in the mid 1300s AD, were there many people expecting the impact on European civilization of the Black Death. Likewise, there were actually not that many voices 20 years ago who have been heard predicting the events of 11th September 2001. Similarly, the speed of the banking crisis 11 years ago and the onset of a recession that left no country or sector unaffected was predicted only with the benefit of hindsight. And most people in 2015, or even in early 2016, would not have forecast the Brexit referendum results in this country or the election of Donald Trump as the United States President. Now, it's of course a truism that um, generals always prepare to fight the last war rather than the one that is actually coming. Sir David, Norman, Sir David uh, Omand, the former UK security coordinator, recasts in a slightly different way. He said, what we pre prepare for, we deter. So what we actually experience by way of events is alas what we have not prepared for. So in the spirit of deterrence, what can we expect and what should we prepare for? Earlier on, I mentioned climate change deniers. Despite them, there is now an overwhelming scientific consensus that Earth's climate is warming. 17 of the 18 warmest years on, on record have occurred since 2000. A global temperature rise of two degrees by 2050 is probably now unavoidable, regardless of any mitigation measures. This will mean future weather events that are more extreme than today's, 
floods, droughts, storms, heat waves, and heavy rainfall will become more intense and more frequent. This will impact on agriculture. It will mean poorer yields and greater variability from one year to the next. And if you think that the Russian heat wave of 2010 led to a global doubling of wheat prices, it gives you some idea of the potential impacts. And then you think about cities. The urban heat island effect will lead to greater temperature rises in cities like London. This will exacerbate urban pollution with all the health consequences. And of course, more and more people are living in cities. By 2035, it is expected that 60% of the world population, which itself will increase, by, will increase from 7.7 billion to 8.9 billion, will be in urban areas, leading to greater pressure to develop land in areas prone to environmental hazards, such as flooding and landslides. In 2000, around 30 million people lived in the urban floodplains in Asia. This is projected to grow to 90 million by 2030. <coughs> Combined with the effects of climate change, this means that the impact of natural disasters will be more severe and more <coughs> severe in what will be new urban areas. What is certain is that around the world, there will be a loss of habitable land as coastal areas disappear <coughs> and as other areas become deserts. Moreover, traditional agriculture patterns will change dramatically. Tropical diseases will move north, and there will be a result, and as a result, there will be a substantial migration and population movements, all of which are likely to produce political tensions and political instability. And much of the global population growth will, of course, take place in the regions with the greatest problems. And while the global economy may continue to grow, that growth will be uneven. The combination of rising population and economic growth will lead to a 50% rise in energy demand, and 80% of this demand will come from fossil fuels where reserves are located in politically unstable areas, or will have to be sourced in increasingly challenging environments, such as the polar regions or the deep oceans. This is likely to mean that nation states will make the necessary political and military movements to secure or safeguard resources. <coughs> and of course, the control of resources will give political leverage to those with control as Russia, for example, has demonstrated in the special Belarus and Georgia and the others. <coughs> A further aspect of this is in regard to minerals, and in particular, rare earth elements necessary for some technologies. Indium, for example, used in liquid crystal displays, may run out globally within the next four years. Tantalum, which I've never heard of before, is used in camera lenses and cell phones. That may run out within 20 years. And it is not known how long supplies of rhodium, used in x-rays and catalytic converters, gallium used in LEDs, solar cells and lasers, or hafnium used in computer chips will last. The countries that have control over those stocks will have a stranglehold over whole areas of technology used throughout the world. Now, if you like, explains the particular rush by China to establish, uh, establish its investment profile in parts of Africa. At the same time, and we're already seeing this, there is a growing internationalization of markets for goods, services, and labor. And what this means is this will lead to local markets and economies being increasingly exposed to destabilizing <coughs> fluctuations of the global economy. The net effect of this is that while average material conditions may improve, the gap between rich and poor will widen. And as communications improve, the aspirations of the less advantaged will be raised at the same time as the disparities will become more obvious to them. This inevitably 
will lead to a greater sense of injustice, leading to heightened tensions. And it will be further exacerbated by demographic trends, with an increasingly aging population in developed nations, but with an increasingly youthful population in much of the developing world who will be facing poorer employment prospects and unfulfilled expectations. We will therefore face the prospect of concentrations of disaffected, frustrated urban youth in decaying urban centres. And that is a recipe for the growth in violent extremism. The combination of food and water insecurity, made worse by environmental crises and areas of conflict, will drive mass migration. However, the neighbouring areas into which populations may try, try to move may themselves already be stressed, and again, that will fuel tensions and instability. I've already mentioned very briefly the impact of improved communications on both aspirations and on feelings of injustice. This will apply throughout the world, including in those areas affected by that food and water insecurity. There's already incredibly rapid growth in the use of ICT. In 2016, 40% of the population in sub-Saharan Africa had access to internet-enabled phones. Now, I do not think we should underestimate the impact that this will have and the opportunities will create for those wishing to radicalise young people in various ways. I was told an anecdote about the Mumbai terrorist attacks. That, if you remember, was uh, individuals who controlled were going in to those very luxurious hotels in Mum Mumbai uh, and killing people. There was a hiatus briefly when they entered the luxurious hotels because they had never previously seen such luxury and they were just amazed. Now, if you have an internet-enabled mobile phone, you know what the wealthy parts of the world regard as normal. That is going to breed this feeling of uh, um, insecurity and uh, potentially radicalization. Indeed, rapid global communication, we have to accept, is a two edged sword. As the quality of formal news sources decline, they are being replaced by unofficial information sources, and these are not necessarily benign influences. Now, I've also mentioned the consequences of increased urban concentration and the challenges to the infrastructure that this will bring. It will also foster the growth of informal economies and challenge existing authority structures. Indeed, coupled with the consequences of climate change, globalization and water and food and water shortages, there is likely to be an increasing loss of confidence in national governments and local administrative structures. The consequences of this will not just be felt in the localities or nations directly affected. The speed of communication and the impact of migration and personal mobility will mean that what is happening in one part of the world will be played out amongst the diaspora and virtual communities in every other continent. As in a city like London, where there are more than 300 languages spoken at home by the children in the city's schools, conflicts that take place half a world away may indeed are being revisited on the streets outside those schools. And all of this will bring to sharp relief in the inherent conflict between the secularism and commercialism on one side and rigid belief systems on the other. That conflict will help radicalize us, and the gap between aspiration and reality, or between <coughs> rich and poor, will provide a pool of disaffected to be radicalized. This is going to be happening at a time of geopolitical change. US preeminence is giving way to a multipolar world, with China and India and perhaps other nations emerging as the dominant major economic powers. But at the same time, there will be increasingly <coughs> powerful non-state actors engaging in illicit trade and international crime. 
there will be more ungoverned spaces. And for that matter, things like CBRN capacity, capability, will proliferate. So I hope I've said enough to indicate that we'll be living in a riskier society. One in which there will be greater political extremism and conflict, and where radicalizers can flourish with volatile and disaffected populations in whose minds their ideas can take root. So back to the context in which we're, um, um, we, I think we have to focus. Notice my notes seem to be in a slightly random order here, which is uh, interesting. Seems no longer have pages uh, ten on but uh, shall we manage? <coughs> Um, there, will be an, there will be an environment in which international crime will be stronger and the restraints on it will be weaker. And there will be problems in building a consensus as to what needs to be done and a limited ability to act effectively across borders as the current international certainties dissolve into a multipolar future. So, this will be a riskier society as uh, state and city authority break down in many places and where international crime and international terrorism can flourish and be nurtured in lawless areas. At the same time, society itself, even in the most developed and apparently stable nations, will become more vulnerable through its increased, increasing reliance on ever more complex and interconnected systems. We all know most critical systems are now internet based and many have been built up over time with new systems overlaid on top of legacy systems in a way which in some cases is now almost impossible to disentangle and beyond the experience of many of those responsible for running and maintaining them. This creates its own risks even before you consider the possibility of external threats. Therefore, our reliance on electronic rich systems and networks, and indeed on electricity itself, and I gather this was touched on in the earlier session, is embedded in the very DNA of our infrastructure. And this presents a real vulnerability. Some of this may be beyond our control. But what it certainly means is that we should consider how we can manage those vulnerabilities. Now, personally, as you gather from the introduction, I approach this from the perspective of resilience to withstand a major shock to our critical infrastructure, primarily the electricity supply and distribution infrastructure. But it could be water, or it could be communications, or food. The point of electricity is that most of our other critical systems are dependent on power supplies. In fact, resilience itself can be perfectly happily threat agnostic. It is about withstanding the recovery from deliberate attack, an accident, or a naturally occurring incident such as a flood or extreme storm. And resilience is thus about deliberately designing your systems so that they are more durable. It's about making sure you have a business continuity plan and a backup system for when things go wrong. And none of those depend on what was the original cause of the event. They are necessary for virtually any event of that sort. So how resilient are we really? And how good are those business continuity plans? I want to illustrate this with a small example, although those that were involved at the time may not have regarded it um, as small. I gather actually the uh, Lancaster incident was discussed in this the first session today. So just to recap, on the 5th of December 2015, Storm Desmond led to the River Loon flooding. That was described, as these things always are, as a once in a hundred years event. And what it did was it swamped the electrical substation serving the city of Lancaster. More than 60,000 homes, and that figure was quoted earlier, and at least 100,000 people were left without electricity for four days, not for two, I think it was mentioned earlier. The review by the Royal Academy of Engineering found that it disrupted transport, communications, and the ability of the emergency services to reach people in need. ATM machines were now action. 
garages were unable to dispense fuel as their pumps needed electricity to operate. Traffic lights stopped working. The train station had to close. Text messaging, digital radio, and the internet ceased to be available. 75 emergency generators had to be brought to Lancaster from as far away as the southwest and from Northern Ireland in order to provide temporary emergency supplies. As the Royal Academy of Engineering noted, this was a comparatively localised area, manageable in size, in a much larger area or locality, with a much bigger population, such arrangements would not have worked. So what would it mean if the uh, outage covered a much wider area, perhaps even the whole country? The Lancaster incident highlighted the interconnected nature of our critical systems and our reliance on electrical power to make them work and society function. Now, of course, much of the critical national infrastructure should have some emergency resources available, it should have emergency generators. But is that capacity sufficient? And will it work when required? A few years ago, some uh, over enthusiastic contractors. Uh, managed to drill through a mains cable in central London, thereby cutting off the supply to the control room of one of the major lifeline emergency services. Service concerned were absolutely confident. In their basement, which as you know is always the best place to put your emergency generation, <laughs> in their basement they have not one but two emergency generators. And what's more, they sent somebody down every morning to check that the fuel gauges were full. What they actually discovered when they needed them was that both fuel gauges were faulty and the fuel had been siphoned off by somebody long, long ago and neither emergency generated were. Now, it didn't really matter because they had a backup control room somewhere else, not that far away, so it would a really big power failure would affect there as well. Uh, and the power failure only lasted for six or seven hours. But it just gives you some indication that's not an uncommon experience. Um, emergency generators tend not to be tested because to do so means switching off your main power and that's disrupted. Um, moreover, even if the emergency generators do work when required, they're often not designed to work for prolonged periods. They've always been taken two or three hours. So the question is how long will they function before they break down? And all that assumes that there will in fact be sufficient diesel fuel from those petrol pumps which won't work to keep them going. So, looking at the Lancaster once in a hundred year event, <laughs> what parallels can be drawn in the event of a major, more widespread outage and one that lasted longer? Well, some services would of course stop being provided. Schools routinely close if the heating stops working or there is a power cut. How many hospitals will function if their electricity supply is disrupted? Presumably some of them will have functioning emergency generators and they can continue, and it believe then will depend on staff continuing to be available for work. And some systems will have to be provided with power, come what may. Nuclear plants, whether functioning or not, will still need to ensure that the reactor core is cooled. Another critical area is water. How long could fresh water be guaranteed? And how long would wastewater and sewage be removed and treated? If you think about hospital, it's got its emergency generators. Actually, it's got staff in there, but no fresh water. Or there is sewage oozing over the floors. Not a good look. A city or town without fresh water or where wastewater and sewage cannot be removed rapidly becomes uninhabitable. In a similar vein, how long could communication systems be maintained? Domestic and business landlines require electric power. The days of low voltage telephony are long past and the vestigial network is being phased out. We all use mobile communications devices, but these have to be charged. And in any event, how long will cell phone masts continue to operate in the absence of power. Spoiler alert, it's two to four hours. Domestic refrigerators and freezers 
will stop working. So will those in small retailers. Indeed, how long will those in major supermarket outlets last? And in these days of just-in-time deliveries, how well will wholesale supplies hold up, assuming that the distribution network can still function? In Lancaster, the ATM stopped working. So how long will the uh, financial system continue to function? Until mm -hmm. this, of course, the uh, various authorities will be working to try and repair and restore the electricity supply. But that, of course, assumes that workforces, engineers, will turn up for work in the expected numbers, as one of the panelists earlier said, in the event of schools being closed, if their families cannot be fed, and if there is civil disorder on the streets. MI5, which is security services, reported in 2004 that the UK was four meals away from anarchy. Now, it does not take much to imagine the implications of civil order of the sort of disruption to food supplies that would ensue from the sort of events that we're talking about here. And we know from the riots of 2011 how easily the thin blue line of police can be overwhelmed. <coughs> as soon as you announce there's a problem, people will go and try and panic by. Last summer, and this is again mentioned earlier, London Resilience ran some uh, exercise workshops focusing on the impact of a major power failure. I have two vital memories of uh, those workshops. The first is that most of the tables had declared martial law <coughs> by day three or day four of the notional exercise. It's wonderful. But the army itself is reduced. And if you talk to them about how their bases would function without power, it's quite interesting. But they are reduced. They can be marvellous in providing support to, say, a single county that is flooded. But if the emergency is much more widespread, it's very difficult. The other abiding memory I got from that, those workshops, was that people came into the workshop pretty confident. They got a contingency plan from Power Bay. Uh, they knew how they'd operate in the event of a blackout. They got their emergency generator and so on. But they were all assuming that the rest of the, that this was a power cut just really affecting their organization. The rest of the infrastructure will still be working. Um, they were assuming that telephony would still work, that internet based systems could be accessed, uh, could be, uh, still be accessed, that there would be, still be water and food, the transportation system would operate, and so on. What would you do? Oh, we call in our engineers. How will you call them in? What makes you think they'll come? And where's your emergency plan? Oh, it's in the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is that all of these critical and essential systems are interconnected, interrelated, and interdependent. Now, there are a number of possible events that might trigger such an event. Some of these would be malign attacks on the electricity infrastructure, such as a concerted physical assault, perhaps by terrorists, on keynotes within the electric grid. This would be difficult and would require uh, significant hostile manpower. But in July 1996, not that long ago, an IRA plot involving 37 explosive devices designed to destroy the six substations providing London's electricity was disrupted and the bombers arrested. The IRA was helpfully Highly infiltrated by MI5 at the time, so they knew what was going on. But I've spoken to the senior investigating officer, and he says the plan would have worked had they detonated those devices. Or you have an electromagnetic pulse attack. This involves a nuclear blast in the atmosphere. Um, now, of course, the advantage of nuclear blasts in the atmosphere is all you have to do is get the rocket up there, you don't have to land it. So it's much easier to do. And it's something that the North Koreans in an official news release, acknowledged they were contemplating as an end product of their nuclear program. So, that would, would do that, and the electromagnetic pulse uh, would blow out electrical systems in a very widespread area. <coughs> we could have cyber attack. This is worryingly plausible. We don't quite know what's just been going on in South America, but let's assume that wasn't one. But we know 
that cyber attacks have been successfully deployed against the Ukraine. Two years ago, the US Department of Defense Science Board reported that the US grid had been so effectively penetrated by Russian and Chinese hackers that either could switch off electricity supplies at will. And it would take, apparently, two years ago, another decade to retrofit those to prevent such an attack. I have no reason to suppose our systems are more secure. <coughs> Rather helpfully, the Americans have just announced that they're been trying to do this to the Russians. I'm sure that's you know, who's going to push this idea out of everybody's minds. So those are the, the human hazards. And then there are the natural hazards. Earthquakes may not be an issue in this country, but it certainly is in plenty of others. Extreme terrestrial weather. Hurricane Harvey and Superstorm Sandy both led to prolonged electricity outages. Um, and in Puerto Rico, Hurricane Irma left 8 million people without power for months. And then you have extreme space weather, the sun's equivalent of an EMP attack. On September 1st, 1859, no one here will remember it, Richard Carrington observed a massive solar flare, which the following day led to brilliant green and purple, red, green and purple auroras all over the world. The northern lights were seen in the Caribbean. At the same time, Telegraph systems were burnt out. Now, 150 years later, while some of the systems may be better protected, we are far more dependent than we were then on electrical networks. In 1996, a huge um, um, solar storm crippled power supplies in Quebec. And on the 23rd of July 2012, a coronal mass ejection of the same scale as the Carrington event just missed the earth. Had it not been missed, the economic cost is estimated to have been $2 trillion, and large parts of the globe would have been without power for months, if not years. It would also have uh, disrupted, to put it mildly, the opening ceremony of the London Olympics. Um, <laughs> I have to say, when we sat in on various crisis preparedness meetings for the London Olympics, that was not a contingency that had been planned for. Now, such events, are regarded as low probability, but very high impact scenarios. But the interconnectedness of our systems adds this additional layer of vulnerability. Complex, highly engineered systems are not necessarily more robust. We're all familiar with that trio of uh, universal laws governing the workings of systems, named for some, no doubt, deeply politically incorrect reason after Irish men. Murphy's Law, which says, if it can go wrong, it will. Followed by Kelly's Law, even if it is engineered so that it can't go wrong, it still will. And the Callan's Law, which says, Murphy and Kelly were both optimists. <laughs> <laughs> so how plausible are these scenarios I've just talked about? Now, many may be individually remote or rare. Perhaps they're like the floods in Lancaster, a once in hundred year event. Now it's a long time since I was taught how to do these calculations, and uh, I may be a little rusty. But if there are six events that each have a one in a hundred probability of occurring in any given year, the chances of one of those six occurring in a particular year is 5.8%. And that means that the chance of one occurring within the next 12 years is 51.2%. That is more likely than not. Obviously, such a calculation depends critically on whether it is a one time per year event, uh, on the consequences and all the other assumptions used. But as the consequences for our society are potentially so serious, I think it is more than justified that today we should all be asking ourselves such questions. Have we focused enough? on the interdependence of our systems with others. How much do our recovery and resilience plans rely on other key utilities and services continuing to operate? And these questions are not only valid for countries, cities, or indeed individual businesses and organizations, but also for each and every one of us. Have we genuinely built resilience into our lives for all eventualities? I'd like to try and expand a bit more audience participation. 
who, put your hands up if you have, has a powerful working torture cone, i.e. one that hasn't been borrowed by children or grandchildren. <coughs> Quite good, probably nearly half. Who's got a grab bag? Right, it's getting going down, about 15%. <laughs> Who's got a wind-up radio? All that gadgets and studying ten percent. And how many of you have enough bottled water at home to stay in your household for a week? That's two litres per person per day. Now, you're people who are interested in this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and what's more, we all assume that someone, the authorities, whoever they may be, will come and sort it out. <laughs> and of course, I'm talking about these big cataclysmic events. But lesser events can be almost as dramatic. A few minutes ago, I mentioned space weather and the Earth being hit by another coronal mass ejection on the scale of the 1859 Carrington event. Incidentally, I was recently briefed on these matters by the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory, and they said cheerily that a repeat was not a matter of if, but when. A CMA, the CME, coronal mass ejection, involves a vast eruption of magnetised plasma exploding from the solar energy the atmosphere with an energy of 10 to 25, that is 150 billion times the energy of the Hiroshima bomb. And the plasma would reach the Earth in between one and four days. There's not much time to prepare, even if you've seen it. The Royal Academy of Engineer near Erie estimate that the recurrence period for a current type event is one to 200 years. And the last such event was 160 years ago. So there we are. The disruptions in power supplies that I was talking about would arise from geomagnetically induced currents burning out key components in the power grid. However, a much lesser scale event, that is one that is necessarily much more frequent than a Carrington event, um, would have, still have plenty of other effects. Orbital satellites would be especially vulnerable, especially notably GNSS, the Global Navigation Satellite System. Many would be damaged by high energy functions at a much lower intensity of events and will be out of action for days or potentially longer. Now, these satellites are not just about our sapnet nows or Uber drivers. We all make jokes about that. More critically, they provide the signals for airline navigation and critically for landing and also for shipping movements. GNSS satellites spoofed in the uh, uh, Black Sea, then by who or for why, led to some ships suddenly finding themselves in coastal waters and being boarded, boarded by the Welland Customs Authority. Magic. Um, it's also, GNSS signals are also central to many time of day applications. International and national financial uh, systems rely on those signals to timestamp financial transactions. So an interruption would cause chaos in the world's financial markets. Other vulnerabilities would occur in smart grid applications and some communication systems. Some people have smart lifts that need to rely on those signals as well. So they don't get stuck in the lift if the sat satellite goes down. In fact, the consequences of a disruption to GNSS have not been adequately mapped. Now, it took the 2010 eruption by that Icelandic volcano with the unpronounceable name for, for some of these issues to make it onto the National Risk Register. Um, and, and in 2011, extreme space weather made it onto the UK National Risk Assessment under Tier 1 natural hazards. Now, of course, space weather has influenced the Earth throughout its history, but its impact on modern technology and the activities that that technology supports are significant and very poorly understood. A year or so back, the UK government uh, commissioned an expert review into our vulnerabilities in this area. And what emerged was that key sections of the critical national infrastructure were simply not clear what their reliance was on GNSS signals. It's never been previously mapped or assessed. So they're told this result to go away and look at it. That work, I think, 
well, I hope, is now being progressed with urgency. Although I expect, actually I know, that Brexit preparations will have taken civil servants' eyes off that particular form. The lesson for all of us, the overriding lesson, is that we probably are not doing enough in terms of investment in our security and in our resilience. Above all, we must be prepared to expect the unexpected. I rather like the taxonomy, which says we have to be ready not only for black swans, previously unobserved high impact after event rare, predict rare events, but also black jellyfishes, things we think we know about, <coughs> we think we understand them, but which turn out to be much more complex and uncertain, sometimes with a long tail and a nasty sting at the end. And we also have to be ready for black elephants, challenges which are actually visible to everyone, but which nobody wants to deal with because they're just too big. Now, I see what Gav gathered, I'm not a natural optimist. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate that I got steadily more apocalyptic during my remarks. But we've got to get beyond the stage of simply admiring the scale of the problems, making every organization more resilient and more strategic in the way it manages risks and the threats faced, makes it more possible to address these potentially global crises and certainly manage the consequences both for ourselves. Uh, and collectively. Often the responses needed are threat neutral. The steps necessary to prepare an organisation are the same, whatever that has it. We all have our own part to play in managing these strategic risks and part, our part in making our own organisations resilient, our communities resilient, and ultimately ensure humanity itself is resilient against the challenges uh, ahead. The reality is that our cities, our communities, and our organizations have to have security and resilience designed in, and it has to be part of society's fabric. Ultimately, it means that every single one of us, certainly not just those in this room, have to see security and resilience as their responsibility, just as much as it's the responsibility of the emergency services and the civic authorities. I said earlier on, that we must be prepared to expect the unexpected. We've got to be prepared. Now, another cultural reference. This was not a reference to Scar in The Lion King, but instead to Lord Baden Powell's motto for the Scout Movement. The meaning being that you must prepare yourself by having thought out beforehand how to act in any accident or situation that might occur so as never to be taken by surprise. And you should have practiced it. So that automatically and instinctively, you can do the right thing at the right moment. Now, I'm not sure that the 1908 edition of Scouting for Boys, or the, the politically correct move, the 1912 version for girls, How Girls Can Build Up the Empire, as it was called, actually spelt out the implications of a coronal mass ejection or a cyber attack or global warning. But they did at least in embryo equip baden Powell scouts with the principles of strategic risk management. First agree the risk tolerance for various outcomes. Do we actually want to survive as a nation? Probably yes. Then assess the threats, evaluate the risks, identify the key weaknesses and their interdependence to look at the risk landscape as a whole. That is the approach all of us here today have to take or aspire to take. So despite my gloomy analysis of the trends that we face in the decade or so ahead, I hope we can all take the advice of Corporal Jones from the BBC's uh, series Dad's Army. Don't panic, Captain Mannering, don't panic. Or to go back to Mel Brooks's film, The Twelve Chairs, that I started with, there is the second verse, second verse of that theme song. Hope for the best, expect the worst. The world's a stage, we're unrehearsed. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Darius. I really loved it. And we have uh, time for two questions, I guess. <laughs> Larry. Well, firstly, thank you very much for a masterly summary of um, what are obviously the most difficult topics we do. Um, I was for five years a member of a large um, a, a 
sorry, of a um, planning, emergency planning committee for a large campus hospital courage in Florence. And during my tenure, we had um, uh, power failure that was instantly followed by generator failure whilst two children were being prepared for surgical operations in the children's week. And then we had the flooding of the wastewater treatment plant that meant that water supply shut down to the point where they were 20 minutes away from having to decide between water for clinical purposes or firefighting. The response to that was a massive engineering intervention, which at least was reactive, at least it was something, it wasn't proactive and it wasn't a foresight. It concerns me that there are some things sitting, staring us in the face, for example, in the eruption of AFF in New York, to take a different um, <laughs> well, I was stranded, as I said before, for uh, nine days long enough to learn more or less how to pronounce it. Um, eight and a half million people were stranded, and yet even now there is virtually no talk about an emergency intermodal plan for moving vast numbers of people. What we know about the eruptions here are that you could get situations of on or fair travel for more than a year perhaps several years, where air travel will be a very, very different thing to what it is normally, with the effect upon both passengers and freight. Yes, that's, that's true. I actually um, spent an evening talking to uh, the uh, head of civil aviation authority, and they didn't, um, they weren't talking about uh, volcanoes, they were talking about the collapse of the airline. And the sheer numbers of people involved there, which have to be moved. Um, gives you an example. Um, I was uh, in New York, as it happened, on the day of 9 11. And of course, all air traffic was stopped and suspended. And again, the length of time it took the systems to get back to normal, the people to be moved around. Um, at the lower level of crisis, um, you can call train. Um, 9-11, uh, a lower level of crisis, or um, the collapse of Monarch Airlines, a lower level of crisis, not for people directly involved, we should be able to plan for that and have systems which are robust enough to cope with it. And if you've got systems which are robust enough to cope with that level of problem, then you've got the building blocks at least to start dealing with a much more fundamental issue. <coughs> Thank you for your presentation. I'm Lin Shuhen from Copenhagen. This summer, I was invited to Siberia, uh, many hundred kilometers north of Moscow, to experience and live in a small community where they make uh, exercises for how we can live very primitive and simple with uh, resilience. Let, let me, I, I said no, I, I didn't uh, accept the invitation. But uh, my question to you is then, when do you think we, we failed in this uh, development? Was it after the Second World War when we set up uh, a system of international institutions where we should run for this imperative of economic growth? Or was it uh, many hundreds ago when we went from uh, a system with very primitive uh, agriculture to industrialization? When, when, when did we fail? <laughs> um, first of all, I'm not sure you can go back to a pre industrial, uh, you may be forced back to a pre industrial situation you know, and get all this stuff wrong. But I don't think we should plan to do that. I think what we've got to do is to start to build into all planning assumptions about things that go wrong. And what's, what, what's driven some of the difficulties are a number of policy uh, things that have happened, which are not related to this at all, but the consequence of um, privatizing utilities may or may not, depending on your point of view, led to greater efficiency uh, and reduced costs. But it also created an imperative to keep reducing costs. And you've written into the regulator, regulator's mandate for that. Now that means that um, when I first got involved in electricity, uh, this is my second job after that, 
Um, the central electricity generating board, as then was in this country, prided itself on having a resilience which was belt, braces, and string. They calculated what was the highest consumable electricity demand in the country, and then added 40% and built the generating capacity to do that. So may have been why electricity and it was felt that we could reduce the cost of electricity by privatization. We're now talking about a, and then of course it's easier now to manage demand and manage um, and, and bring new um, generating capacity in and out very quickly. But we're now talking about a margin of probably way below 10%. Now, you've taken out that resilience from that particular structure, and that's something which I think is quite, is quite you know, uh, economically driven. We've got used to a just-in-time situation. Again, that saves money. But it also means your stocks anywhere, it's the movements of goods ceases, are very limited, or they're, they're not necessarily very new. So there'll be a series of economic changes which will happen, which I think make all of this more difficult. Um, those are the bits we can start to reverse um, at the time. The other of the bits is that um, we become less self reliance Now, if you go to the United States, of course, there are lots of survivalists of what the population is, and that seems to involve stockpiling your guns and maybe your tin food. Um, but in this country, that's not what we're used to. Certainly in urban areas, people just assume the authorities will come and sort it out. We're entitled to this. We're expecting our electricity to be on, the water to be on. It goes off for 20 minutes. This is a major inconvenience and a major problem. Um, the Swedes have got a civil defence board that's available online, it's uh, translated helpfully into English, um, that uh, for the public as to what to do in the event of an emergency. First message is, if you are told the Swedish government has surrendered, that is fake news. But it includes some very practical measures as to uh, what you, as your, you and your household should do. UK government has circled around it. They can't get over the, what they call protect and survive in the days of civil defence, which uh, people treated with some hilarity and by and large disregard. Well. You, know, you had to um, take your front door off, put it on top of your kitchen table, and hide underneath it or something. Um, however, and, and they've they shied away from you. They've got two concerns. One is if they put around a booklet like that, which gave sensible advice about like, can you keep some bottled water in your home? Can you uh, perhaps have some tin food and, uh, and so on? But the other two assumptions, one was it would be complete ridicule if the government's got off their collective trolley. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, I can see why they're worried. Um, the, 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 the second is that the assumption would be why are they put this out now? There's something they're not telling us. And that will produce exactly the same panic and you've run out of tin food and bottled water because of the, the bar buying, which then take place. So it, it is quite difficult. You have to build these community and societal resilience up over many years. This is what they've done in some of the Baltic states um, and, and, and so on. It's something we have to think about. Mm -hmm. Last question. Thank you for the great presentation. So, how do we get these messages out successfully to a wider audience? Um, and often, when talking about resilience, people come back to me and say, "Well, who's going to pay?" Which leads me to want to pull my hair out. Um, I've resisted so far, but how would you respond to those people who seem to think that that some or have, or will pay? Or how do we get around that question? Um, you can't get away from the fact that it is going to cost money and resources. Um, what you've got to do, start doing is building the um, mechanisms which require that to happen. So, for the main uh, utilities, their regulatory regime has got to include within that expectations about their resilience and robustness. At the moment, some of the regulators cannot even consider that. They're only mandated to look at price. <coughs> You've got to change some of that. There has got to be an expectation that we've got to build in the fail safe. My fear is that the only way people will take this seriously is when something catastrophic has gone wrong, at which point people will start to um, realize.
realise this matters. It may be that one of the positive byproducts of where we are in Brexit was that so much planning started to be done on what's called Operation Yellow Hammer, something civil servants have been given on these issues, was seconded very quickly by the other what I regard as pressing issues, um, were no longer seen as priorities. But some of that planning will then feed through and recognise <coughs> that uh, you have got to look at how you manage your, your food imports, how you manage your distribution networks in the event of any disruption. Um, but the, 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 the tragedy of public policy making is you nearly always have to experience it before you start planning to resist it. Just one more. One more? Okay, perfect. Um, hi. Yeah, I just want to. I was just wondering, to what extent do you think um, that all this emergency planning offers somewhat of a band-aid effect on a body that's potentially gone through some major trauma but is about to be hit by a bus um, in the future? I mean, it's, it, it seems like you were planning for something, but at the same time, policy is being formulated with it for you know for growth or development or in the energy sector uh, sector are going ahead without any consideration of disasters of climate change or, or any of the risks um, that we might be facing in the future. So to what extent does planning serve a purpose? I mean, it's just kind of um, putting a, a plug on something that's already been happening. So. Well, being able to put the, uh, the, the bandage on, uh, make, and knowing how to do that and to practice that is resilience against all sorts of things. Okay, it's not the solution if you're then hit bus, but it is a good thing to be doing in itself and to be making it happen. It's part of, if you can have the building blocks for better resilience, then it becomes easier <coughs> to build the superstructure, the, 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 the rest of the superstructure together. Um, what we'd like to really get to is a position where the long-term implications of policy are taken into account and make it. And that's not easy. Um, you have an electoral cycle in all democracies, which means that uh, uh, politicians think about winning the next election and what matters, and taking decisions which will not conceivably produce benefits during your term of office, or um, you'll still be flung out of office um, if the catastrophe happens, uh, because how hard you prepare, you <coughs> that makes it very difficult. To take these long term decisions. There's quite a lot of work which has been done in uh, Cambridge Center for Existential Risk, it's sponsored, all about trying to how do you future proof things for future generations? There isn't an easy answer to that. It may be that the climate emergency stuff and um, um, the school girl and so on, um, climate emergency <coughs> response is the beginning of a recognition by today's children. But actually, unless they um, force us, the adults, to start taking these things seriously, their lives are going to be seriously going. That may be a positive effect, but of course, children don't have to vote. They might have to vote in five or ten years' time. You feel quite in like the four years' time, you're not that old. Um, we have time for another one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very sorry. I have uh, a thousand questions myself, uh, but uh, it seems that uh, we have to go for lunch. So uh, I would say thank you, Lord Darius, for your great talk. Uh, and Thank <laughs> you.